Madonna Tart instant success wasn't quite so quick. Her first novel, The Secret History, took nine years to write, but it set off a bidding war among publishers, which is virtually unprecedented for a new author. An instant bestseller, The Secret History, is winning praise for combining a savvy literary literate style with an edge of the seat plot, and we are pleased to have her here with us. Welcome. Thank you. Um, how'd you do it? Um, Worked every day. Yeah. Worked every day for eight years. You've always wanted to write and, and for, for a long, long, long time? For a long time. Ever since I, um, ever since I was a little girl, I um, always loved to read books and I thought, what a wonderful thing if I could just read books all day. But writing is even more wonderful because it's a deeper level of involvement. You know, when you're reading a book, you're very caught up in it. But um, yes, writing a book is, is, is one step beyond. It's one, yeah. it's, 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 um, it's a depth lower. It's was wonderful. the first law of fiction or poetry, prose or poetry? Um, well, when I was a little girl, my first love, I mean, stories, storytelling. Yeah. I mean, you're a Southerner, you know this. Southerners sure. love to tell stories, love to listen to stories. I mean, um, and then when I was in high school, uh, when I was a bit older, it was poetry. All my favorite writers were poets. But, um, Did you dream of being a poet? Oh, yeah, and still do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In vain. Show me a, su <laughs> show me a successful novelist, <laughs> and I'll show you a, a wannabe poet. Well, it's true. I mean, in order to be a good poet, you have to have an ear for language so fine that to a novelist, it's really almost diseased. I mean, to... Um, um, and I just can't help it. I mean, I have just a real narrative sense. Things present themselves to me as stories. I see... If, if I try to write a poem, if I try to concentrate upon images yeah. to... Too, too heavily, a narrative will just always impose itself. Yeah. So. You had written short stories before this, hadn't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm hmm And had them published or not? I'd had some of them published. I'd actually, the first things I ever had published were poems. Yeah. Uh, when actually I was quite young, when I was 13 or 14, I had my first, my first poems published. Yeah. Um, but um, I've, written, I've written some short fiction and probably will continue to do so, but um, it's not my, my favorite form. I love, I love novels yeah. because um, you know, in a short story, you're only getting a glimpse of, of, of something. You're only getting a, a tiny little, a tiny little fragment of the world. You started out at, at, at Ole Miss. Right. Yeah. Why did you transfer to Bennington? Actually, on the advice of my friend Willie Morris, um, when I was a freshman at Ole Miss, um, I was. Um, I was in a graduate level writing class. I was taught by Barry Hanna. I had gotten in and... Um, yeah, he said he convinced the others that you were genius. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Barry why we, can convince anybody of that's anything. That's why we're Barry's letting this 18-year-old in. Barry and Willie are both great talkers. They could, you know, they could So you got in this writing read. course and, and, and then Willie and Barry said... Well, um, they, they said um, that it pro And they were quite right, I mean, that I should... I should um, go someplace else and see what other people were doing. I mean, um, you know, schools in the Northeast then were very sort of cutting edge and the thing was minimalism, which I had never heard of. I mean, everybody was Raymond Carver and Beattie, you know, writers yeah. I had never heard of it at all. And, you know, um, I was, um, you know, the books I grew up reading were, were, were Dickens, were, were Mark Twain. I mean, I was just, I, I had I I was I'd never seen a copy of the New Yorker. I don't think until I was 19 years old. How about Faulkner and Eudora Welty and people I like that? I love Eudora Welty. Love Eudora Welty, and I like Faulkner. But um, um, Faulkner's, I I have to. I mean, in a certain sense, one has to read for pleasure. And and Faulkner's a genius, and and one loves to 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 go through his books and see how they're constructed and they're amazing concoctions, but just in terms of reading for pleasure, if I were sick in bed you in the hospital, I would, I would, I would <laughs> not, not ask my mother to bring me a copy but, but, of William Well, Bob. then what would you ask your mother that you've read recently, to, if you were sick and just wanted to read for pleasure? Oh, what have I read recently that's so good? Um, um, it's, I mean, it's terrible to ask me these questions because I, I just read the same books over and over again. Um, you do? Yeah. I, you know, if you, you look back at construction, you look back at at character development, you look back at all those things. I, I love a book more, um, the because the first time you're reading a book, you have. I mean, you're discovering along with the writer. Do you know you're you're? Mm. I mean, it's sort of an inductive process, and you don't know quite where he's taking you, and it's it's very wonderful. Um, 
you can understand the process better. As a young writer, the way a young writer looks at a book, it's the way a young architect looks at a building. And you can, you can see better how, how things are constructed and how they're put together All the right. second time around. Speaking of construction, uh, tell me about the beginning of this. When did the idea for this begin? Um, I mean, when was the moment that, that sort of you said, what? If you had to find the very first, if this was a journey of a thousand miles and you had to have the first step, what was it? The very first step, in a way, was deciding to reveal the murderer on the first page. No, I'm, I'm taking it even back further. In terms of the idea to write this thing, I mean, was it to reveal the murder on the first page? You, you wanted to write a, 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 a murder mystery in which you wanted to reveal the name of the victim on the first page? Yes, and um, one of the reasons why I wanted to do that, it was um, partly because I'd been studying Greek, and you know, there's, there's tremendous suspense in, in the Iliad, and you know everything that's going to happen, they tell you everything that's going to happen in the first six lines, and I mean, this was just a very interesting question to me, how do you, how do you create suspense from knowing what we already know, and then it was funny. I love Alfred Hitchcock, and I read something that Alfred Hitchcock said. He said, suspense doesn't come from having a bomb thrown from nowhere, um, you know, at, one, at the hero. Suspense comes from having, you know, two people sitting, talking at a table. There's a bomb ticking underneath the table. And you don't know when it's going to go and off. And the audience sees it, but the characters don't. And that's what suspense is. And, um, I don't know. I mean, in, in a funny way, that was, that was what made me want to write this sort of novel, do you know, um, which, which is a suspense novel, but um, at the same time, I think that, um, I mean, I'm very interested in craft. I'm very interested in aesthetics, and um, it seems to me that a book can be suspenseful, can be very well constructed and very tricky in terms of plot, lots of ledger domain and mirrors and smoke being thrown up and surprises, but also also be a well constructed thing, also be aesthetically pleasing yeah. and pleasing in terms of style from sentence to sentence. Why a murder mystery? Um, murder is just one of the most um, it's actually funny, almost all my favorite novels have, have a murder in them, yeah. do you know? I mean, and very unlikely novels like Huckleberry Finn, you know, um, you know, they, um, or, you know, Oliver Twist, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't think about that, but um, it's, it's just one of those, maybe when I'm 40, maybe when I've lived a little longer in the world, I'll be able to write a book about love, as if now I don't know enough about that yet, but, um, but you know, those are those are the two great themes: love and death. And yeah. where did you start after you decided that how you wanted to start the thing? Did you? How much of it worked itself out as you began to write, versus how much of it did you see all the way to the conclusion? And then the challenge was the skill of writing. Well, I thought at the first I saw it all the way to the conclusion, which was actually not at all true. I, I started from an outline, but it was basically just to sort of comfort myself going on a cross-country journey and having a map. You know, and of course, along the way, you have to take all kinds of unexpected detours. One comes to some very crucial point that one's been leading to for a hundred pages, and then the characters would just have developed to such a point that you would realize that 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 logically they wouldn't do that. I mean, the characters grew along with the book too. The characters sort of became alive. And so, what you might have imagined for them would turn out to be in in consistent with what they would do. Exactly. As they would take on a character, you'd realize what you thought they might do would not be something that would be appropriate for them to do because it would be out of character. It's exactly, it's exactly the same process as getting to know people, as getting to yeah. know friends. At first you think you've got them figured out, you know, and then, and then, but people always surprise you, you know, people, people always do. How much influence from your peers? I mean, this book is dedicated um, for Brett Easton Ellis, whose generosity will never cease to warm my heart, and for Paul Edward and, and others, um, how much did they influence you? Well, Bennington was a very wonderful school to go to because um, the, I think a lot of writing programs, there, there's a great deal of cutthroat behavior, there's a lot of competitiveness, but at Bennington, um, we were all really quite supportive of each other, and we were all doing very different work, but we read each other's work, we commented on each other's work. It in was a progress. Good, yes, works in progress, and it was, a very, it was a very good sounding board, and there wasn't, 
I mean, you, you hear horror stories about, you know, people sabotaging other people's work, stealing yeah. it, you know. And <laughs> Sounds like law school. Yeah, it does. But, you know, it did, didn't happen at Bennington. And we, you know, we really all stuck together, and even though we were doing very different things, and really tried to help each other and did help each other. And I think it's very funny that, you know, I think about my creative writing class when I was 19, think of the faces around that table. Half of those people are published authors yeah. now. How much do, do to the talent you have now come from um, what you've learned in, in, in classes, being taught by creative writing classes, and, and you learn from other writers like Willie Morris and, and others that might have had an influence on you? How much of it is that versus just natural, going much more a product of what you were as a child and this in instinct to write and this sort of literary flair that you probably had. Well, you're talking about two different things. I mean, in a writing class, it's a writing class is like a drawing class in a certain way. I mean, they you got to have some technique they to can, survive. They, they can teach you how to how to construct um, a decent sentence, how to construct a readable plot. Um, you know, just in the same way in a drawing class, they can teach you you draw your hand seven times. Can they times make you a good writer if you're They can make you a good writer. They can yeah. make you a good writer, but you know, in the final analysis, I mean, you know, all writing, I mean, there's, there's magic, there's some... And where does that come from? Um, I don't know. If we did know, that yeah. would... But I mean, is it, what is it, though, that magic, that, that... I mean, what's... Do you have any idea why this has done so well and created such a sensation? Um, I was, I've been very surprised by the response to it, which has been um, wonderful. I mean, beyond my wildest dreams, this book has found, actually, quite a large audience. Um, um, and I, yeah, I've, I've been very surprised. I mean, I've just got, gotten back from a book tour and, you know, just all and, kinds of people, all kinds of people. And what do they say to you? When, you they know, when they come up to you in a book signing, what do they say? Um, Gee, you write a great story. Um, wonderful things. When I was in Miami, um, you know, right after the hurricane, people, people coming up to me with these waterlogged books and saying, you know, this is what I grabbed when when I ran out of the house. When I realized I was going to be <laughs> away from my house for a while. Yeah, and, um, you know, I mean, things like that. I mean, it, you know, it makes eight years, eight years of work worthwhile to know that, um, you know, that even uh, one person... And what happens when you went back to Bennington? Um, for, to, 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 to visit the campus after you had become a successful I was actually only there for a short time. I was only there for about 20 minutes. I was basically only there for the photograph, yeah. so it was... Um, oh, you went up for a shoot to, just because they wanted to have a background of you mm -hmm, at Bennington? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so you had no real in exchange with the, with the students there now? A little bit, a little bit. Bennington's changed very much since I was there uh, in the early 80s. It's, it's a different school. There's a different administration. It's... it's, it's it's, it's not quite the same place it was when, um, you know, most of the teachers I had there have, have, um, are, are not there anymore. It's a, it's a very different yeah. place now than it was in the early 80s. There's a great quote from you, which had the philosopher uh, Karl Popper talks about living in three worlds. World one is New York City, uh, where we both see when we walk out the door. World two is a subjective world, New York, as I see it through my eyes. And then there's world three, and that's where Plato's Republic is. That's where Dr. Johnson's London is. That's where Oz is. I've always been most comfortable in World 3. It's true, yes. Yeah. You're, so you're most comfortable in what? How would you characterize it today? In World 3? Yeah. Where is World 3 today? Well, the World 3 today was Switzerland. I was reading Nabokov, Transparent Things, um, and I was in Switzerland with Hugh Person and Armand. Yeah. So that's, that, that's where I was today in the 1930s. John Grisham, who's been here, uh, who is a, has a genius for writing bestsellers, uh, has got two or three on the bestseller list now in paperback and hardback, says, what a debut, a beautifully written story, well told, funny, sad, scary, and impossible to leave alone until finished. Not since The Prince of Tides have I enjoyed a book as much as this. You'll take that, won't you? <laughs> Thank you. Norman. Thank you so much. Pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tomorrow night, Arthur Mitchell of the Dance Theater of Harlem recounts his company's controversial tour to South Africa, all of that and more. See you tomorrow night at 11.